this is the Meet at Purdue podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Meet at Purdue podcast brought to you by Purdue University Conferences and the Purdue University Office of Engagement. My name is Chris Bishop, and I am joined, as always, by the director of Purdue Conferences, Nick Benora. Nick, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you today? Oh, I am just check local listings, enjoying this unseasonably warm weather that we're it's having here in November. It's been such a nice weekend. So, well, we're going to do things a little bit different today, and I'm super excited about this. Uh, have one of my favorite people joining us, as well as our first guest, uh, Aaron Van Emmen, is an event production manager from the Hall of Music at Purdue University. Aaron, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. This is awesome. Aaron, I want you to start out, if you would, by just giving us a little bit about your background. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, sure. So, uh, like you mentioned, my name is Aaron Van Emmen, and I am one of three production managers here for Hall of Music Productions at Purdue. Um, I was a student here at Purdue um, and graduated and then was fortunate enough to be offered a position to stay on board here. Um, so I all collectively with a little break in between, I've been with the department now for 10 years. Um, so I've uh, been here long enough to kind of see uh, obviously a very big shift in live events to a virtual world uh, thanks to a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah, we Nick and I have talked about that a lot. What, uh, you know, what producing or um, planning events has has shifted from and then two in less than a year has just been it just it's just been an amazing unbelievable shift that we've had um so give us a little bit more information on on what it is you said you're a production manager with the hall of music what is what does that entail so um my overall job is to work with clients um and for the most part most of our clients are campus based um, but we do do some work within the community. Um, but I work with the client to basically understand what kind of event they're looking to do. Um, and then basically take that and translate that into more of a technical production role. Um, so microphones, lighting, video, staging, um, all of those things. I also kind of help to navigate when they come in and they're like, we're not exactly sure what we want to do, but we know we need to have this person present this. Um, so sometimes it's also kind of helping to determine the scope of their project and maybe the best way for them to accomplish that. Um, as you've mentioned, uh, what I did pre-COVID and what we're doing during COVID, um, while the fundamentals are the same, it has been a huge changeover um, when you're used to having people in a venue, um, being able to be really hands-on with the technical side. Um, to a world where they're not with you at all and you're limited only what you can do from the other side of a camera or computer screen. So when you are, are you working with a team as a production manager? Yes. Give, give us a little, um, so like, I'm the, sorry, give us a little idea of, of what that team looks like. Sure. So um, the Hall of Music is made up of approximately 30 full-time staff members. Um, most of our staff all have a, uh, specialized feature, if you will. So they're lighting or video or audio, but many of our technicians also have crossover uh, where they may be, you know, predominantly video, but can do some audio work. Um, so what I'm doing is to kind of coordinate on the front end. Um, and then they are really the true heroes of the show because they're the ones that are taking all those concept ideas, requests, and turning them into the physical piece of work um, you know, doing the recordings, whether audio or video, building the stages, um, you know, designing and running the lighting. Um, so it, it ends up being a whole kind of team effort uh, to pull off both the in-person that we used to know and the virtual world that we're now in. All right. So Aaron and, and Nick, I want to I want to get thoughts from you as well. Um, talk to me about the differences from a production standpoint between a live and a virtual event? Sure. So, um, you know, live is predominantly what I've always done. Um, and so those involve physical spaces. Those involve actual participants, both, you know, presenters on stage, 
folks as well as um, audience members, people coming into the theater to partake in the um, and for my experience and for the Hall of Music, the virtual side was always kind of secondary to what we did. We weren't necessarily producing events um, for the virtual world. Um, we were more um, more or less using live streaming virtual, you know, uh, software and features to open a window into a live event. Um, so there, while there's definitely similarities, um, you can't really say that a live event translates directly over to the virtual world or vice versa. Um, you know, there's there's definitely similarities, but we're discovering every day that there's more and more differences between the two worlds. So it has definitely been for, for me personally, um, as well as our department to figure out how to change that over um, to be able to, de to deliver the high quality of work that we're used to delivering, but having the limitations of not being able to physically have all those folks in one place. So you brought up a good, really good point, and it's something that Chris and I have discussed in the past, which is how live events do or do not translate to a virtual experience. So one thing that I do want to ask you is, from your opinion, and having gone through this a couple of times, uh, for those people out there that are listening that are considering doing a virtual event, they've had a live in-person event, they're wondering about, you know, or they're thinking about transitioning to a virtual event, would you say that from your experience that there are more or less people involved on your side with um, a virtual event or a live in-person event? Um, definitely, it seems to be a much bigger staffing need on the live side. Um, you know, it was kind of funny the other day, We I was doing a planning call for a virtual event we're doing this week. Um, and the individual who's joining us is not from campus, she's an outside entity. Um, and she was fascinated by the concept that we were going to take a Zoom meeting and then stream it out to YouTube. Um, and she's, she was, you know, well, how do you do that? Um, and I said, well, it's a guy with four laptops sitting in the basement of a building. And she started laughing and I said, no, I'm not kidding. Um, that's literally what it is. Um, so where is in a live event, um, you know, you'd have various people throughout the venue doing different roles, where in a live stream virtual world, from a technical standpoint, it could be as little as one person, depending on what kind of platform and format we were calling at. Um, so definitely lower needs on the technical side for virtual, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're less complicated. Um, Fewer people doesn't always mean less complicated in our world. And I think that's what I was going for was the amount of energy that you still have to put into the event. Like you said, might be fewer people, but the, the level of complexity doesn't necessarily drop just because there's fewer people involved. Absolutely. I mean, you know, so things we never had to worry about before, uh, when you have four panelists sitting on a stage, you know, we have pretty much 100% control over their microphones, right? Um, and we also have pretty much 100% control over turning on the lights to make sure that they can be seen. When you have four panelists joining via Teams or Zoom or WebEx or whatever platform, we have no control. We don't have 100% control over their internet signal. Um, we probably have zero control over that. Um, you know, we can kind of coach and say, can you sit closer to your microphone? Is there another lamp you can turn on? You're a little dark. Um, but we don't have the ability to go in and fix those things. Um, and I can tell you firsthand that that's been a very big struggle and frustration for our crew because we're so used to being able to fix those problems. And here we're really at the reliance of the person on the other end, making sure that they've got all of their tech stuff in place. So one of my questions that I have, and and, and please don't name names, <laughs> um, and what are some of the mistakes that you've seen? And, and the reason I ask this is that we, we've, we're still new at this. I mean, we're, we're still figuring this part out, and then, and now we're about to get into hybrid. So we're still trying to figure out where we are with virtual and hybrid. What are some of the mistakes that you've seen with people just jumping immediately into virtual? Um, you know, I think it varies from area to area. I think one of the biggest mistakes is that people, you know, here on Purdue's campus, we have a lot of annual events, um, you know, that you can almost set your watch that they're going to be at the certain date and time. 
So I think we've all gotten really used to that event is what it is. We do it the same way every year. We might just have some different faces on the stage. Um, and as I mentioned before, not all events that you did live directly translate virtually. Um, so I think we've I've seen some folks that tried to take an event that works amazingly in person, but they tried to do the exact same format in the virtual world, and it just didn't it didn't get the point across as as easily and as well that it did in the in the in person. Um, so I think you really have to take the moment to think about it differently um, and not necessarily as you know lining it out as people would do it in person but rather how does that work on video for instance you know you might be able to get 100 people to sit and listen to a 90 minute keynote present you know presenter um but who wants to sit and stare at their computer screen for 90 minutes which seems weird because i'd sit and do it but there seems to be kind of almost this psyche of when you're with a group of people in a space it, it doesn't seem to be like you know, as bad as sitting at your computer. And maybe it's the distractions. Maybe it's that I can watch this keynote and answer email for the whole 90 minutes. So I think it's, uh, you know, so length of events has been something that I think people have planned too long of events. Um, instead of looking for ways to say, I've probably only got their attention for maybe 30, 45 minutes, maybe 60 minutes tops. Um, so those are kind of some of the big things that I've seen, um, which by being able to see those, I've been able to help clients by when they show me this and go, you know, is there any way you can kind of trim this down? Cause 90 minutes is going to be kind of long. Yeah. Nick, Nick and I actually on, on a past episode spoke about that very thing that the, the pacing, just the, the rules, the rules of engagement in terms of traditional conferences are probably going to be thrown out the window in terms of oh here's a 55 minute session and a five minute break or I I think I think that we're going to see um, a lot of differences in, in terms of structures and you know we've seen anything from one hour a day for 30 days four hour days you know um, 15 minute sessions thing so th there's a lot of different things that I that I think that from from this standpoint is really interesting because there are no rules right now. Right. Everybody is, we're, we're all kind of at the same baseline and we're all trying to uh, to figure this thing out. Um, Aaron, I wanted to go into some of the, some of the questions um, that people should ask or that people e either ask themselves or that a planner should ask um, when planning a virtual event. What are, what are some of those questions that that need to be dealt with in order to make the virtual event successful? Um, you know, I think we, we've kind of talked on, you know, overall intent, uh, you know, what you're trying to get across. I mean, those are probably some of the higher level um, things, you know, length of time we're going to spend, you know, how many people are going to be a part of, um, you know, that's another thing that we've seen when you have panelists. Um, when you you don't necessarily get all of that nonverbal body language communication when you're not in person with folks. Um, and then you've got the delay that happens in technology. So panels can get really messy really fast when, you know, Nick starts to answer at the same time I start to answer. Um, so, you know, really thinking about format of, you know, how you're going to handle multiple presenters or multiple panelists. Um, so, I think there's those. Then you've got the technical side of the questions that are probably more of what I'm asking. You know, um, how many people are going to attend while Zoom can handle lots of people? Um, is that really the best method to bring 100, 200, 300 people on, um, ask them to keep their mics off and not have that distraction? Um, you know, is it better to bring in just the presenters into Zoom or another meeting plat web? web meeting platform and then send that out via YouTube or a live stream where the end user is just watching and not necessarily in. Um, so there's all kinds of different questions and I think it really depends on what kind of the initial format is and what they're who they're trying to reach and then you start to kind of dig through those details and figure out what the best execution of that is. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Nick? Yeah. What are, do you have an example of some of the more successful ways that 
those formatting questions have been answered that you've seen? So you're, are you speaking of like how you choose which platforms to go where? No, I think that's a separate, a separate question is the technical side of the platforms, but from a formatting standpoint, what are, if you were to give advice to people, what's a format that you've seen as that has been really successful that isn't sit in front of your screen for 90 minutes and listen to a keynote? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I mean, it's still sit in front of your screen and, you know, watch, I think panels, when the panels are done with a really organized structure, really that requires some kind of moderator. I think those lend itself to be the most, um, engaging, um, because you're not just listening to one person talk for 90 minutes or maybe even at 60 minutes. Um, there's a lot of folks that are integrating video into it. Um, so maybe some of the remarks are pre-recorded, or maybe there are, um, you know, opening videos or little videos that kind of break up the 90 minutes. Um, so maybe we've heard somebody talk for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then there's maybe a little video interlude um, that maybe touches more on what they were speaking about. Or, um, you know, one of the things we see a lot are normally we would have students be a part of some of these events and, and in the whole protect Purdue and trying to keep everybody safe, we've been getting a lot of student testimonials. So it might be a keynote who speaks and then there's a student video that plays um, that brings in a different perspective or things like that. Um, you could absolutely PowerPoint slides, uh, presentation slides are still a part of these presentations today. Um, and there's different ways to handle, you know, those in a web or stream. Um, so yeah, I think that there's definitely ways to interchange just somebody going on and on for 60 to 90 minutes. And then the follow-up would be, what are those platforms from the technical side of things that you have found have been the most successful? From the platform side, um, you know, I guess I'm going to have to do some product name dropping here, which I've already kind of done. Um, Zoom seems to be kind of the favorite that everybody uses. I think it's because of its accessibility. Um, and, and overall, it, we find it to be very reliable. Uh, we've done a lot of streaming out to YouTube. Um, again, I think it's the reliability and the accessibility to it. Um, it doesn't, you know, for a lot of folks, we've commented, for a lot of folks, this has been a super huge change. Because I know that prior to the pandemic, I could probably count on one hand and not even need all five fingers the number of times I had done a web meeting. Um, pretty much all of mine were either conference calls or actual in-person meetings. Now it's like I do multiple web meetings a day. So even I had a learning curve to learn the technology. So um, we find that Zoom and YouTube tend to be the things that people can figure out fairly easily. Um, so we do a lot of that. Then we also um, have adopted into what's called vMix. Um, and it is more of a, it's it's still, it's not necessarily meeting software. It works similar to Zoom in the sense that you get a link and you connect into us, but it lets us have more broadcast control over it. Um, so we can do a lot more broadcast look and a lot more polished and professional look than just the average Zoom meeting being streamed out. Um, so those are those are platforms. We've done anything from a keynote with PowerPoint to I think we've done up to a five, six, seven person panel um, with those. Um, so there are definitely solutions out there that I think are really effective in the virtual world. All right. So, Aaron, I want I want to shift gears here. And um, Nick and I have talked probably on every episode when we're talking about virtual events, we talk about the need first and foremost for a quality production. So, and we've also talked about needing, you know, the possibility of using a production company. So from your standpoint, as being an event producer, what are those benefits of using a production company? Well, I feel like I have to like put an honesty clause here and say, I'm going to be really biased on this question since I am, you know, part of a production company. Um, but basically, I think it is really about taking skills and experience and knowledge that a production company and, you know, drill down the folks that are a part of that production company, what they already have. Um, you know, these are the people that their job is to make sure that they're up on technology. And um, coming from a live event side, we approach things like 
Zoom or YouTube or things like that with a little bit of a different perspective that we're not necessarily seeing a Zoom waiting room as a clear waiting room. We're looking at it as a way that we can let in presenters and have that backstage area before we let guests in. Um, so I think we're looking at features within these platforms and, and some people say limitations. I think we're just looking and saying they're features, what can we do with them? Um, so I think a production company is going to approach the concept a little differently than somebody taking it on themselves, if that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect sense. One of the things that I've said in the past and, and learned early on in my career was you have to have a sane estimation of what your capabilities are. And if you know, we run into it ourselves when people say, well, I, I can, it's just a conference. I can do that. Well, okay. Can you really though? And if there are professionals out there that do this every day, like your, your team, Aaron, and our department as well, it's what we do day in and day out. And if you have those tools available, absolutely let the professionals take care of it because it's going to be worry-free, problem-free, and the event owner can then focus on the event itself, not all of the technical or production aspects or even design elements that have to go into it. We take that on for them and they can just enjoy their event. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, what, and, and I've seen this happen more times than not. Um, you know, you've got a host and, you know, luckily I've seen this when we're doing them. So we're, we're worrying about the technical side and getting the event up and running. And if the host would have been trying to do it themselves, they're scrambling, trying to find where their last presenter who hasn't shown up is, um, you know, and they've had to step away, you know, quote unquote, step away from the event to try to find that person. So I think just having that dedicated team, just like you would if you were to walk into, you know, a, a conference, nobody can do that on their own. The same way that they would walk into one of our venues, they wouldn't want to be responsible to turn on lights and run projection and run microphones, and they may not even just have the skill set to do that. Um, so I think you're you've hit the nail on the head. It's just about having somebody who does this for a living to say, we've got you, go and enjoy your event. Nice. Yeah, I, we've seen firsthand how there, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot more than you think when, when there's, oh, oh, it's a virtual event. Well, there's a lot of moving pieces, and, and we've seen it firsthand, the, the, number, the number of things that are going on at the same time. So having said that comment, I actually want to – as we wrap this up, I actually want to give the audience an idea of of how to build a virtual event, and I want to pay particular attention to the production side. So I'm going to throw out just a, an easy scenario, and Nick, um, what I want you know what I'm going to ask you to do is to is to help build out the day or however many days you think it should be, and then Aaron, I'm, I want you to. Um, give us what you would do from a production standpoint. So I'll make it real easy just, just for this scenario. So it'll just be a, it's a typically a one day, let's say 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. There's a morning keynote. There's uh, a lunch. There is an afternoon uh, right after lunch panel session. And there's breakouts. I'll, I'll say a reception, but let, we'll leave that for... We'll leave that for later. Um, so pretty standard, just a one day, eight to four. Uh, it typically is 150 people, mostly from the Midwest, although there will be some, in the past, there were some international attendees. So there's your scenario. Okay. <laughs> Go, right? <laughs> right. Real simple, easy. No, I, I would say if you're... If you're going to take an event that's that size and was typically a single day event, I think right away you cut it down to where your programming time is going to be roughly four hours. You can accomplish all of those things, the keynote, the panel session, breakout sessions, an opportunity for networking and engagement. You can condense that down into four hours. And then you get away from what Aaron was talking about earlier, um, people sitting in front of their computers all day, zoning out, losing attention. Now, because people, and we know this, um, not just from the experience of producing virtual events, we know it because we've all, I think, here have attended virtual events. 
And while the conference or that virtual event is on one screen, I'm reading emails that are coming in on the other one. I'm taking phone calls from people. I'm getting up and, and doing other things. So an event that size, 150 um, fairly local attendees plus some some international, you could break that down. Now, you've got time zone considerations, but you could break it down into into four hours in one day. And, and let's just say it's Eastern and Central. Let's just say it's it's mostly, yeah, mostly Central and then Eastern time zone. Yeah, so. I think you could condense that into four hours and, and be just fine. So let me, Aaron, hold on just a second here. Um, so what do you do with what do you do with the keynote? Like just just give a quick example of what you would do with the keynote. I think you would. You... Well, I mean, I think my first question would be: Is that keynote supposed to be able to be engaged with folks? Um, you know, one of the benefits of YouTube is that it gives a really nice, clean, um, you know, presenter basically in the backstage, if you will, with a forward face of YouTube. Um, but do you need the ability to ask questions for that keynote or is it just a presentation? Um, I'm kind of more of a fan of being able to just broadcast that out to YouTube um, and that could be done. There's ways to limit who can see that. Um, so for the keynote, I would I would do a, a Zoom or vMix from our perspective um, out to YouTube. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. And I think that that would be, you know, from a platform standpoint, that would sort of be the main stage. So when they come into the event, they're they're there they're watching but they aren't necessarily participatory at that point they're there they can see the stage they can watch it and go from there and then uh, when that's over if i think the next thing in the scenario was a panel discussion that was going to happen um, then then maybe it peels off at that point and the panel discussion maybe isn't out there on the main stage in the same technical aspect because you want the audience participation, but that would be the next thing that flows in moderated so that the moderator, I think, can feed the questions to the panel rather than four people trying to read the chat section or the, or the questions as they come in and then not knowing who's going to answer. First, to your point earlier, Aaron, it gets really convoluted when there's four panelists spread out in different parts of the country all trying to answer a question. It it just looks it looks yeah bad. definitely and and I would I mean obviously if we were doing this as a, a in person live event the keynote and the panel those would be the the feature parts of the conference of that day long conference um, so those I would treat just like that and I would have those be you know, web platform out to a streaming platform for both of those. Um, you mentioned breakout sessions. That's where Zoom just shines um, because you can do individual meetings um, that people determine which one they want to go to and they click that link and they're a part of that. Um, or Zoom even has the breakout room feature that everybody can convene in one Zoom and they can either be automatic, they can be predetermined which meeting room they're going to or it can be random where you just say randomize and it puts people in different breakout rooms. Um, so those, uh, Zoom was really, it's really tailored to handle something like that in a format. What's your thought on live versus pre-recorded sessions? You know, I'm, and maybe it's because I come from a live world. I like the live world. I like to know that somebody has, if, if I'm taking the time out to attend an event, that the presenters are doing the same. Um, it's, you know, it definitely, I think if it's pre recorded, you've pretty much eliminated any possibility of having a, an engaging QA. You could always have pre submitted questions. Um, but I, I like the live side. But pre-recorded, we can't get somebody schedule to match up with what we need. It's absolutely doable. Um, you know, I think the, what I would, what I prefer to see is somebody who's taken, you know, maybe an extra step to do a professional recording versus on their iPhone that they've propped up against a book on their bookcase. Um, so, but totally an option, and we certainly have those pieces that have been parts of some of the events we've done um, when it's just out of necessity. You know, we've talked earlier about speakers or presenters that maybe have a PowerPoint presentation. And I think we've seen bad examples of that where the presenter was on Zoom and then they end up sharing their screen to see their PowerPoint. And then you see everything else that's on their home screen, you know, and on their desktop. And it, it doesn't come across well because it's them sharing their screen. And it so 
from a professional production standpoint, what's your advice for how to do that effectively in a virtual conference where you've got the speaker, but then you also have slides or a PowerPoint or, or whatever the medium is that they want to share that's part of their presentation? So that's where um, I think this kind of circles back to uh, why why would you want to use a production company when you could do it yourself? Um, I'm going to guess that most people don't have the um, rooms full of equipment that we have. Um, so we have additional equipment that we can put in line. So typically we encourage people to not do a shared screen, but to send any of their content, whether they're slides or videos or what graphics or whatever it may be, um, that they send those to us ahead of time, then we can actually change the input um, into what we're sending into the web meeting platform. Um, so we basically turn our our login, if you will, we turn it into one giant shared screen. Um, so we can do that without exposing, we can do it kind of behind the scenes. Um, and so we've literally, it, it, my description earlier of four laptops and a video switcher is really how we're doing events these days. Um, so we've got one laptop that's doing the web platform and we've got another laptop that's just feeding content into it uh, with some equipment in the middle to make that all work. Um, so that's just another reason that, you know, gives that polished, really professional look that you probably would have been going for in a live event. Great. No, it's so kind of like switching from camera one to camera two in a live event to get those different perspectives. You're just switching. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly that. So on this on this hypothetical scenario, Aaron, the last thing I want to discuss and we, we get the term thrown around all the time, engagement or networking. What, what are what are some of the things that you've seen, if any, that are effective ways to engage and and or network? And, and those are where they get um, a little bit tricky. Um, I think obviously the bigger the group, I mean, it's, it's no different than in real life. Um, if you attend a networking event and there's tons of people in the room, it's it's harder to network. Um, but it's easier because you can kind of like shiv me off to the side and talk to a, gr a small group of people. Uh, when you're in Zoom, what you say, everybody hears. Um, so I've seen um, the use of breakout rooms to do some of that small group discussion, um, you know, whether it's a predetermined or just randomly here are the five folks that you get to chat with um, in a networking kind of a thing. Um, engagement, it you know, for the most part, everybody's relying on the chat feature if everything is in Zoom or the comments feature on YouTube um, to ask questions. There are also a lot of third party um, vendors or suppliers, I guess I would say, that have software that that's all they do is they manage. Um, it's a, you know, ask your question here and then there's different ways to display that to the moderator or panels or however you're setting it up. So I definitely think that there are ways. I think they're trickier than when you've got everybody in one place. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's some awesome advice that you just gave. Um, as we finish up here, just tell us a little bit about specifically um, Hall of Music and and then finally how we can get in touch with you uh, or how our audience can get in touch with you. Yeah, so um, I would say just to kind of wrap it all up, and I don't think we really touched on much of it, um, but I think I'm starting to see that Hall of Music is trying to blend our two worlds. Um, they're trying to not completely give up on the live side um, and to embrace the virtual side. So we're starting to do a lot more hype, what we're calling hybrid events, um, where we might have a, a moderator in studio with us, but all the panelists are joining us via a web meeting platform. Um, so I think we're really trying to find those safe ways to still have that live interaction um, and make it feel like it's not everybody coming to you from their living rooms um, and being able to assure that at least the moderator, the, the keynote, whoever might be live with us, that we're assuring that that quality going out virtually is the highest quality that we can offer. Um, so I think we're really starting to, and we get a luxury there because we are on a college campus. Um, so a lot of our folks are, can safely come to campus. Um, we have venues and spaces that allow us to do it safely. Um, so we're really trying to leverage that 
um, as a, a virtual service with not completely giving up on our live world. Very good. Tell, tell uh, the audience how they can get in touch with you or your team at Hall of Music. Well, um, I would love if they got a hold of Purdue Conferences and then Purdue Conferences got a hold of us because then that means that we would have a collaboration. Um, but they can easily email me at e van emmon and that's e v a n e m o n at purdue.edu. Um, that's probably the quickest way to get to me. And then from there, we can coordinate maybe a web meeting or something since we can't meet in person. And, and our preference is the first one you described also is yeah. give us a call and we'll call Aaron. Yeah, call, and... call conferences and let them see if there's anything in there and then they can call me and then we'll just we'll split the responsibilities and go from there. Absolutely. That, that collaboration and partnership is something that we count on a lot and we appreciate the times we've been able to do it in the past. And I know that we've got a lot, you know, uh, ahead of us in the future where where that's going to be the reality. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm excited to see, I mean, I think for us, the conference part is the one piece we haven't really done. Um, and I think it's really because you guys are the, you, you guys are our conference folks. Um, so we haven't gotten a lot of that experience yet on managing multiple breakouts and keynotes and panels. And we've done a few small little things for some departments, um, but not near to the size that you guys um, historically have handled. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to see where that collaboration goes, um, you know, as we're learning with some of the smaller events and to be able to help you guys in the future. We are as well. Well, Aaron, we appreciate you joining us. We're definitely going to have to have you back uh, sooner rather than later to discuss more things on the production side of uh, virtual and what's, what's going to be hybrid events. So... Absolutely. Well, thanks for the invite, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks so much, Aaron. Have a good one. You too. Thank you. All right. We want to thank Aaron Van Emmon uh, from the Purdue Hall of Music for joining us. She gave some great insight. On she, she really did. She really did. And, and I can't really reiterate enough how important it is to seek out those those professionals don't don't try to do it yourself you're just going to create a headache that will ultimately make you not enjoy the event that you've worked hard to stand up i mean focus on what you need to do find those partners out there that can carry the load for you so you can just enjoy the event i think one of the one of the neat things about the hall of music is they're a lot like us in the fact that they did close to 100 percent live events and they were forced to completely remake their business. So, you know, they, they did a lot of the same thing that we did. They, you know, roll up, they rolled up their sleeves and they, they figured it out and, and they really do some good work. Absolutely. Yeah. So. We, we've got a couple of partnerships uh, in the works. And one of the things I'd like to do is have her back after we've done some of those and maybe break, break an event or two down into detail and, and talk about how we did, uh, different components of that to make it work and be successful. Absolutely. Well, that's going to wrap it up for today's episode. Thanks as always uh, for joining us, Nick. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, follow us on uh, the YouTube page, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, we'll have Aaron's contact information uh, in the in the show notes for uh, on the YouTube page. So, but I, I would really recommend, um, taking what she said seriously because they, they know their stuff. They're, they're really good at it. So for Nick Benora, Dave back on the ones and twos. Thanks, man. Great job as always. I'm Chris Bishop. We'll see you next time.